Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April 2021 meeting, uh, community meeting of the I2B2 Transmark Foundation. I'd like to turn it over to our managing director, Diane Keogh. Diane? Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, the April meeting. Um, can't believe it's April already. Um, it seems like a very, very um, long year, um, if, if you know what I mean. Um, and I, I have to uh, I have to apologize for my shortness of breath. I'm in um, Colorado, and for some reason the altitude is really bothering me. So I'm walking around with my face mask on, um, thinking about how awful it would be for people who have um, asthma during the pandemic. And so anyway, if you have asthma, I feel sorry for you. Um, so I uh, apologize for my, my, uh, my breathing. Um, so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, um, the agenda for this meeting is really to focus on um, a shrine um, update. Um, and you can go to the next slide, Rudy. I think we're gonna jump right in. Okay, we'll talk about the Boston meeting in June. Um, I'll give you a little heads up around the agenda uh, for that meeting. Um, and then we're gonna dive right into um, an update on Shrine. Next slide. All right, so here, this is under construction. Um, uh, basically here is what the, the, day, the two days are gonna look like. We'll have spot, sponsor updates. We'll have a few um, use cases. Um, we have one that's on the agenda now um, from uh, Russ Waitman from the University of uh, Missouri uh, talking about deploying I2B2 on Snowflake and um, AWS. Um, Ken Mandel will be our keynote um, speaker um, and we'll, we'll have an update on 4C, a pretty um, deep update on 4C and then a roadmap discussion. What I wanted to focus on today was really what we're gonna do for day two. Um, we'll have our working group updates, um, ETL, ontology, um, and user interface, um, as we usually do. And we used to have a, a, an ACT, the second half of the second day used to be around the ACT network. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna refocus that um, and really look at the Shrine infrastructure um, and, and um, what's, what's gonna happen with, with Shrine moving forward. So that will be, and hopefully this discussion will help us kind of formulate um, the Shrine update. Um, so now I'm gonna turn this over uh, to Mark Siriello, Anna Pama Maram, and Doug McFadden um, around what's happening with Shrine. And I think the first thing we'll do um, is jump into a demo of the 3.1 um, version of Shrine. And so I will turn it to Anna Pama and take it away. Great. Thanks, Diane. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and get started with the demo. I'm going to share my screen. Perfect. Um, I realize that so my battery power is a little low. It's just it, my computer is not charging. So I might breeze through this a little quicker than I normally would. Um, just a few notes about the new Shrine 3.0 release. Um, one thing I really want to emphasize is that the majority of the work um, that uh, and feedback that we received for these features was a direct result of um, the engagement with the I2B2 community, um, with the I2B2 UI working group, um, and also the ACT community. So we were really able to build um, uh, connections and, and got the right feedback and communication to make sure um, we were building the features that users were really um, looking forward to. Um, the, the second biggest goal of, of this release was making sure that um, when we initially had released the new 3.0 web clients, there were some features that, um, you know, due to the interest that we had to release in one year um, and the focus on novice users that we didn't translate from the legacy web client to the new UI. So this release was really tr making sure that we could incorporate those um, really high value features into the UI while making sure that they were still discoverable and intuitive and um, not only for the novice users, but also um, what we've been calling like the advanced users of the UI. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and log in. So um, immediately on the find patients tab, you'll notice a few things that might pop up pop up at you um, in terms of the changes that we've made. 
So you'll notice this new radio button up here, this when radio button. Um, so that's a third option now for when you're trying to define your inclusion and exclusion panel. Um, and down here below in the search act network panel, we now have this checkbox for including the demographic distributions. So as I'm walking through the demo, you'll, you'll see these features. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and just um, build my queries. I'm looking for patients that are over, um, sorry, over 65. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pick this and then delete that one. Um, now I'm gonna look for patients who have um, some type of diabetes. Go ahead and drop this in the next column. And then let's pick patients who also have had a, a confirmed case of COVID. Um, so with this query, I want to find patients um, that are over 65 years old, have had a diagnosis of diabetes and had a COVID-19 confirmed case. Um, you'll notice up here, and this is a new feature that we built in, specifically when a panel contains a demographic feature, we've now disabled the ability to add date ranges or multiple occurrences because um, those aren't really applicable to a demographic concept. So anytime a panel contains at least a demographic concept, then that entire feature becomes disabled. Um, and we also have text to make sure that the user clears out um, that data that's already in there. Um, another thing I wanted to point out here, um, one of the new features that we built is, you know, if I continue to um, build out, uh, you know, just dragging and dropping terms here, and I realize, you know, these aren't the terms I want in this specific panel. We now have the ability to move terms within the panel. So not only can you drag from the medical concept list over to the query builder, you can now drag to other panels as well. And that you know, is obviously changing the logic of your query. Um, so I could drag it to a previous um, uh, panel here, or I can drag it to a new panel below. And again, when you do that, the default it is always a inclusion panel. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete these because these aren't relevant to the query that I'm interested in building at the moment. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and select my topic. We also added um, these uh, layouts here so it's easier to know what uh, the, the button that you're selecting to trigger an action. So I've selected my topic. I'm going to go ahead and auto generate my name. Um, and I'm going to include my demographic distributions. Um, so demographic distributions is how we have rebranded uh, what's formerly have been called breakdowns. Um, and if you'll recall from the legacy web client, initially when you were selecting breakdowns, you had to select individually each of the breakdowns, so whether you wanted age, gender, race, or vital status. Um, instead, we decided to streamline that and include one checkbox, and that will provide all of the breakdowns um, when you run your query. So I'm going to go ahead and count, go to the count patients tab. Um, and again, this delay you're seeing is mostly because of my computer. It's not the <laughs> network itself. Um, so immediately you'll see that uh, a couple things have changed on this tab. So we now have this whole new section here um, dedicated to our demographic distribution. And you'll notice that as the query is running that the data is changing dynamically in real time. So as it's running, all of these graphs will continue to build out. Another thing I wanted to point out is that we made the decision to create aggregate charts. So these breakdowns, um, you know, in the old, in the legacy web client, we had um, per site, a breakdown chart per site and per breakdown. And so that would be about, you know, if there were 60 sites, 60 times four charts. And so we really felt like um, bringing a roll-up chart would be, um, a lot more useful for the researcher to identify the stratification of their, of their data. And up here, they can go ahead and download a CSV and that will be the same CSV they currently have access to in legacy. So that will be a breakdown per site. Um, so again, what is the query is running? So these charts are gonna change and you can hover over and get the information per specific breakdown. Go ahead and collapse this up here. 
Um, a few other features that we built out here, we reformatted the criteria. So we made it so it's a little easier for the user to be able to decipher um, what they were building. Um, and a big feature, again, this was also a big uh, feedback from the community, was being able to download the site results. Um, so instead of having to copy paste the information in the table, um, you just click this link here and that will provide a CSV and it will be in the same format as um, you see here. So it'll be that two column uh, layout. You might just, again, the, the delay is mostly due to my computer. And so you can easily parse that um, information and close that out. Okay. Um, and then the last piece um, is the uh, the ability to create temporal queries. And so, uh, you know, the difference is in this query, I'm asking for any time in that patient medical record, um, you know, they're over 65, they have a, a case of diabetes and they've had a case of COVID. But if I wanted to add a timeline or a sequence to that, um, it's really easy. So all I have to do is select this when radio button and you'll notice it's a, it's it still fits in the uh, query builder format, but it's a different panel. So we have these little icons here to sort of visually represent to the user that it's a um, it's a time bound query. Um, so my uh, panel automatically sent anything that was there into the first event. So my first event is the diagnosis of diabetes. Um, and then I want that to have occurred before any occurrence of COVID. So I simply just um, that drag and drop feature is really helpful to be able to select that concept and drag it here. So for my events, I always have to have at, um, two events. And of course you can add additional concepts here, but they will always be or, so I can have diabetes or any other, um, you know, any other condition you would want here. And again, these would all be or and same with event two. Um, I can define um, just a date range for each of these events. And then here, what we're, um, the sentence is defaulting to the first occurrence of event one has to occur before the first occurrence of event two. Um, the user can go in and change that. They can specify a time gap and then enter, you know, the, the unit of time and then select whether it's months or years and they can specify whether it's the first occurrence or any occurrence. So I'll just go ahead, select that. I can continue select demographic distributions if I wanted that type of stratification and then I could count my patients. Um, I ran the same exact query just a couple minutes ago so you can see sort of um, the layout and the count. So it's reporting that I have 39 sites with up to 12,000 patients and then the query definition here has also um, been updated to reflect that uh, temporal aspect of the query. So find patients that are over 65 when um, the first with a diagnosis of diabetes happens at least five years before the first with COVID. And I also added a date range um, to that COVID criteria. And then, you know, again, you can edit the criteria to reload those concepts back into the query builder. So those were the two big um, features that we um, that are part of this release. Um, so if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them. Hi, this is Wendy from UCSD. Are you going to show us about the labs? how to select a lab or large or oh. smaller than certain yeah, so I, I, I remember you had asked this question in another meeting. So one yes. of the things I would point out is that in the laboratory test folder, there are two separate um, 
lab folders. So this provisional folder, um, it's much more, um, uh, I, I believe the concepts themselves contain the, the value. Um, so when you drag this over, it's um, complete like that. For the laboratory test folder, Uh, looks like Amy Palmer. Uh, looks like she fell off. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. So let us just go ahead and move on then, and we will get Amy Palmer back into the conversation for folks who um, actually that share my. Um, for anyone who does not know me, I'm Mark Cerriello. Um, I'm a project manager here at Harvard Catalyst, working with the Shrine development team, and uh, with Amy Palmer as well. So I'm just going to go. I'm sort of emceeing this part of the conversation. And what I'm showing here is just our agenda. So we just had our demo of Shrine 3.1 features. I will mention that what is out there and available right now in the open source community is Shrine 3.0. The features that you just saw, things like the temporal queries and the demographic distributions um, are available, will be available in Shrine 3.1. And we expect that that will be available next month to the open source community. Uh, so that was sort of part one, like where we are, what we're working on right now part two of this conversation um, is sort of taking a step back, um, talking a little bit about the history of Shrine for those who may not be familiar, and also getting um, your feedback on development directions that we might take with the Shrine product. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the history, as I mentioned, and then uh, a little bit about what is coming up in the release that we expect after 3.1, so 3.2 release. We know some of the content of that. And then Anu Palma and I will run through some of the sort of considered possibilities just to kind of, you know, seed the conversation. And then again, we would like to hear from all of you about whether you think these are valuable or not, or if there's other ideas that you have. Uh, and some of these, again, are sort of more blue sky ideas. Some of them are maybe more practical and easily implemented. But for the moment, we're sort of thinking the, you know, how easy would this be to do off the table and just want to talk about sort of value and what the, the community feels like we should be working on. So at this point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to um, Doug McFadden, who is the uh, CIO of Harvard Catalyst and has been with the Shrine effort uh, since the beginning and can give us just a brief history of Shrine for those who may be unfamiliar or may only know it through recent implementations like ACT. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, and as you pointed out, um, I was privileged to be around at the very start of Shrine. Um, we started uh, work on Shrine in 2007, so 14 years ago. <clears throat> it was part of our first CPSA application and the primary goal, uh, since Harvard has a number of affiliated hospitals, um, sort of loosely affiliated, was to uh, provide access uh, for investigators across the Harvard community to um, electronic uh, medical record data across a, a number of Harvard institutions. Um, the ones that participated in a strong fashion were uh, MGH, Brigham, Beth Israel, Boston Children's Hospital, and Dana Farber. Um, Shrine at that time was uh, really based on the prior work of I2B2 and SPIN, sort of a combination of the two of those. Um, uh, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with I2B2, but uh, SPIN was the uh, uh, I believe I have the acronym right, Shared Pathology Information Network. Um, Andy McMurray was um, the primary um, advocate and architect um, at that time. Um, and that was for um, sharing uh, metadata about uh, uh, specimens available in pathology uh, labs. So um, there was a number of sort of fundamental principles that went into the design and implementation of Shrine. Um, of course, the first, Pretty much already mentioned it allows investigators to query the uh, electronic medical record data at all participating institutions. Um, it's a federated network. Um, the electronic medical record data stays local to each participating institution, therefore providing, I think, a, a high degree of, of comfort for the institutions to participate. Um, institutions share risks uh, equally, so only investigators and institutions that contribute data can perform queries. That's, a, that's sort of an underlying principle. Um, as far as I know, every network that's been implemented with Shrine um, embodies that principle. Um, it's not enforced within the system, but um, it, we feel it's, a, it's an important principle um, having to do with you know, the, 
the, the legitimate risks of uh, providing access to electronic medical record data. Um, the, uh, one of the other key things is to really reduce the regulatory burden for investigators um, by sort of implementing within the infrastructure a variety of sort of security mechanisms and obfusc obfuscation and things of that sort so that um, individual investigators do not need to um, uh, acquire a um, IRB approval. Um, uh, typically, IRB approvals are made when, when uh, institution implements the whole infrastructure at their site, um, and then uh, investigators just have to agree to a data use agreement when they log in. And then lastly, uh, something that I think we don't think about a lot, but it's ontology agnostic. People can take the Shrine software and implement uh, a variety, you know, whatever ontology they want within that environment. The ontology is essentially the query language. So it allows uh, different networks to be built uh, with sort of different kinds of data sets. Um, there are, were essentially two primary publications that came out with this initial work. Uh, there was one published in JAMIA in 2009, another one in PLOS One in 2013. Isaac Kohani was the PI for both of these and they've been cited hundreds of times. Um, so um, if you ever wanna see a blast from the past, you can go back to those. Um, since uh, we developed this for the Harvard community, we've of course released it open source. Uh, I believe we le released it open source around 2009 and there were a significant number of networks that picked it up um, and did their own work with it. Um, some may have picked it up and not even let us know that they were working with it, but the ones we do know of um, are CICTR, um, which I believe was on the West Coast. There was Karanet, which was a, the first implementation of a very large network, 60 um, institutions involved for pediatric data. Um, there was something we called the National Proof of Concept, which I think, believe led to the PLOS One uh, publication in 2013. And of course there were um, the Cori implementations. The local one we had was called Skills. Um, Greater Plains Co Collaborative uh, implemented a way back and they, they still are. And then there was, of course, the, the uh, UC uh, implementation, UC Rex. And then finally, um, ACT um, is the most recent implementation. Um, so, you know, there, you can, as you can tell, there's sort of a, a broad history of uh, use in the open source community. Um, and you know, we continue to encourage this. And uh, um, so sort of look forward to um, you know, other networks showing up. Um, ACT, of course, is a big one across the CPSA community, but um, you know, we encourage open source use. So if you find another application, um, feel free to use Shrine. Um, just a quick overview and some of the recent uh, advances and capabilities, which go a little bit further back than what Anna Palma was talking about. Um, so uh, several years back, I think when we were looking at the ACT implementation, uh, we designed a, um, a uh, honest broker component. We call the data steward so that each site can easily monitor all their users. Um, before that, it was a little bit more difficult to keep track of what your users were doing. Um, we also um, made a significant architectural change in the network, um, whereas the initial implementation of Shrine had each site that was participating um, act as a server so the queries came in and they uh, processed them locally. This, this led to some instability and uh, performance issues within the network. So we reversed that. We um, made our hub the server and each site is a client now uh, polling the, the server and it works uh, quite well and with a high degree of stability so that um, if some sites are down or slow, um, you will get the results quickly from all the others. Um, as part of the ACT process, uh, we performed an integration with some IPv2 plugins that support local co cohort creation. Um, and uh, uh, Sean Murphy and his team can talk a little bit more about what those are, maybe at another meeting if uh, folks are unfamiliar. Um, and um, as recently as last year, over the last year, uh, we've both uh, implemented the novice uh, friendly user interface that Anapama um, showed you. And uh, worth noting, uh, we did a lot of early work um, right around this time last year 
um, regarding COVID-19. Um, and what we discovered there was that we could rapidly uh, implement new features within the ontology and roll them out very quickly, um, which was uh, necessary in the early days of COVID-19. It would be necessary in the early days of any sort of new disease area where the um, coding and terminology for um, that disease um, may be in flux. So that's sort of the, the quick version of uh, where Shrine has been and some of its major um, steps along the way. Um, uh, glad to take any questions now, unless Mark, we're going to postpone those all to later. Nope, I think it'd be fine if folks have questions now, they can jump on in. We'll, we'll pause for a moment for that. And um, while we do that, I'll also mention that you can use the chat to ask questions. Um, we do have a couple of comments and questions popping up in there as well. So if folks are not feeling like they want to join in uh, with audio, feel free to add a question into the chat as well. Um, so I, I see a question from Keith about uh, Shrine supporting OMOP uh, CDM for Shrine Networks. So um, the, uh, there's a complicated answer and then there's probably a shorter answer for this. Um, virtually all the implementations I'm aware of um, use ITB2 as the data warehouse um, uh, that um, Shrine then, uh, the Shrine software at each site then queries. Um, it is certainly possible to um, build uh, or implement a non ITB2 data warehouse that try and can query, but you'd have to emulate the, um, the ITB2 messaging structure for these queries. Um, I do believe that, um, that more than one site um, has uh, implemented, um, uh, as Sean has mentioned right there on the list, um, a uh, sort of mapping of the OMOP CDM into um, essentially an ITB2 emulation so that Shrine actually can um, uh, query that without um, any significant changes, um, sort of ITB2 being a translation layer there. Yeah, I see uh, Michelle and uh, ITB2 support SAML. Um, so, um, and, and more, um, so th I think there's a, a lot of interest right now in, um, how, um, the shrine, um, user, um, authentication process works. Traditionally we've used the ITB2 PM cell, and I know many folks have, uh, implemented, uh, local additions to the PM, PM cell to handle their enterprise authentication. Uh, systems. Uh, I believe that there are uh, folks um, working on SAML, uh, similar SAML solutions, and we're very interested in sort of seeing the, the um, outcome of that work um, and, you know, possibly including it directly within um, a Shrine open source release in the future. Thank you, Doug. Um, we're going to just move the conversation along a little bit. It's actually great that we're uh, jumping into some questions and ideas about the future, because uh, that's exactly what we're here for. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and then I'll um, kind of we'll kind of go back and forth between me and Anupam in sort of a conversational way about some of the things that the Shrine development team has thought about in terms of future development, and we will also then open that up for discussion. Um, either what we're talking about or questions that you have or ideas that you have that are, you know, completely different than what we're talking about. So um, this next portion is really just a kind of seed conversation and it sounds like the conversation is already underway. So we won't uh, linger on it too much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And hopefully folks can see that okay. Um, so Doug just gave us kind of a step back into the history of Shrine for folks who may not be as familiar. And now we'll just talk a little bit about some of the possibilities that we have discussed within the Shrine team. And again, we'll go through these fairly quickly and then we'll kind of open it up for discussion about, um, you know, whether these are of interest or there's other things that are of interest. So Inupama, are you um, able to hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I'll run through these. And I'll mention some of them and then let you provide just a little bit of color commentary and we'll spend, you know, five minutes or so going through some of these and then we'll, we'll switch over to discussion if that works. Is that all right? Yep. 
Okay. So the first category we have here, um, and I sort of always joke about the fact that there's no shortage of good ideas about what we could do with Shrine. And I think it's true here. It's more just about prioritizing them. So there's lots of ideas about enhancements to the web client, to the query interface. Um, and one that we've heard about and have you know, considered is enrollment tables in supporting um, the flow from uh, like basically right into a grant application. Do you want to say any more about that, Anu Palmer? Yeah, so this is actually um, something that uh, we were hoping to get into 3.1, um, but you know, due to prioritization, um, we're hoping to include in a future release. But we've heard from um, researchers that this is something that they run this is the NIH um, specified like information that researchers need, and I believe they need this almost you know when they initially apply for their grant and almost every year afterwards as an update. Um, so it's a it's so very these predefined queries um, that specify, I believe, like gender, ethnicity, um, and uh, a, a couple of other categories. And so um, that was definitely some of the things that you know we've heard from the community as useful features um, as part of uh, being able to run a query and setting up um, you know the, the right steps and what are the next steps after running a query. Um, and I'll just go through these other ones, Mark, as well. Um, so, you know, for the ontology, part of what we did in this new web client was creating a Lucene index um, to be able to help researchers have a more access to a quick and robust search to be able to find those terms. Right now, that search is limited to whole words that are contained in the ontology itself. Um, but with the use of the stat text stack that we're using, there's opportunities to augment that search to include um, additional third party um, ontologies and also being able to code uh, or being able to map, um, you know, brand names to medications. So, so for example, if I search for Tylenol, it will correctly show me acetaminophen. Or if I search for uh, more colloquial terms like heart attack, it would map me to the correct term. So being able to incorporate, I would say like a smart search um, to be able to really help researchers if they're not very familiar with uh, code concepts and uh, medical terminology. Um, you know, there's also things we've heard in terms of the interaction itself. So being able to locate those terms, um, view them in, in uh, the order of the ontology. So when you uh, reload the concepts back into the query builder, not only is it reloading the concepts, but it's also automatically expanding the ontology to match that. Um, we've also heard about uh, previous queries. Is there a way for us to enhance being able to um, search, you know, instead of just scrolling, maybe there's a way uh, to search for those specific queries to be able to um, find them? And then also, is there a way for users to compare the results of queries within the UI itself and not necessarily have to do that in Excel sheet or in some other application outside of the tool? All right, thanks for that, Anupama. The other ones I'll mention here, um, beyond the sort of enhancements to uh, sort of search and how the user interacts with the um, with the user interface. Uh, Doug sort of touched on this. So we've heard some feedback about the idea that we may want to revisit the idea of how queries are monitored, how user behavior is monitored, and the use of query topics. Um, some folks have expressed confusion about the purpose of that or the reason for it. And um, so we may be able to take some steps to make that a bit easier or more intuitive for users. Um, or perhaps revisit the idea of whether they're necessary at all. Um, I think this is again sort of a blue sky kind of discussion, but that's something we've heard is you know what are these query topics and why and it not necessarily being it feeling like more of an impediment to searching and doing your work than it is an enhancement of it. Um, workflow and next steps after a query. So great once you've done a successful query, what do you do from there? Maybe there are some things we could do within the Shrine tool to smooth that next step into collaboration or reaching out to a site. Or again, maybe that's out of the scope of what Shrine should you know, attempt to accomplish. Um, again, we sort of present that here as kind of a blue sky idea to ask for uh, the feedback of everybody on this call about that. 
Um, another one is enabling a sort of a transferable query format out of Shrine is one we know that there's been some interest in and some work done, you know, some way to sort of take this query that you've constructed and pull it out and either share it with another individual more easily than you might be able to now or pull it into a different tool and get that exact same query um, could be another area that we work on. And then of course, you know, any other sort of pain points or directions that folks feel like we might want to undertake here. So what we're really asking for the group here is um, knowing what we've talked about here and what we know we're going to be working on in 3.2, which I'll, I'll share now, um, you know, where would you, where would you have us look or what do you think are the most valuable areas among these or others? Um, so let me take a step back here to 3.2. A couple things we know we're going to be working on in the upcoming release um, is going to be able, is taking the um, 2020 web client or the new web client, the basically the search interface that you saw in Obama demonstrate, and to make that um, configurable for other networks uh, so that, you know, it can be used by other implementations of Shrine um, other than ACT and to just make it more open source friendly, if you will. That's one thing we know that's a high priority for us to do uh, for the open source community. And we've also got some technical depth that we won't get into here. That's not that interesting, but the thing, some things we want to get done um, to sort of make the software a little easier to maintain and maybe a little bit more reliable, um, you know, things that any sort of software development effort would want to do at times. But we really do want to know um, what the folks on the call think might be the most valuable things here um, in the future for Shrine based on what you know about the, the history of the present in the immediate future. So at this point, I'll sort of stop talking and um, I'll invite folks to either put questions into the chat or to um, unmute yourselves and either share, you know, again, what you feel like, what resonates with you most, what you feel like will resonate most with users um, or just what you think is most you know, valuable for us as a product. Any thoughts from the group on that? I guess I'll kick it off since uh, there isn't a rush to the podium. To the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, to, to echo what Dominic was asking, I think that um, we, we're actively trying to get SAML implemented for the next release of I2B2. And I know Bill and some other Shrine leadership people have mentioned that they would like to get this into Shrine. I think that that would be for, for the sites that need SAML authentication in order to keep moving forward with networks like ACT, I think it would be a really important and possibly not too daunting feature to add once we get it into the ITBCPM. So. All right, I'm seeing some other, um, seeing from uh, Sarah, SAML authentication, um, other folks that feel like authentication is uh, a major sort of area for them or have sites customized um, or done any any work in that area themselves for sort of local consumption. Yeah. All right. Well, authentication is definitely something we have. Again, as Jeff sort of alluded to, um, we have heard about and we're hearing some some sort of push for. And I believe that there are sites that have used have done some work on sort of sign on in Shrine. I'm thinking back to a June meeting, either one or two years ago, maybe two years ago. Um, so we will. Um, We'll take that into consideration. Other thoughts? Yeah, we, we're sorry. I, it's not my meeting. I shouldn't shouldn't keep jumping in. But we we we've we've kind of surveyed the landscape. There are a couple of of sites that have hacked uh, SAML into into I two B two. It's it's really I two B two more than Shrine because they changed the PM cell. So, but we're going to try to take their best practices and discover best practices from that and create an approach that you guys could could leverage if you wanted to. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Andrew Vajos from the Medical College of Wisconsin. And um, we've implemented LDAP just so that we can communicate with Microsoft Exchange. But again, like the, the previous speaker said, that was a, a change to the I2B2 PM cell, not Shrine or Shrine itself. Um, for the enrollment tables, uh, I would suggest you look at the the underlying technology under the breakdown queries, because I think you can achieve it leveraging that functionality um, within I2B2. 
Yes. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've actually, I think of the enrollment, I mean, Michelle, do you feel like the enrollment table is a valuable feature for us or? Yeah, I mean, it's something everybody does with every grant and it's just a simple, I mean, it's a relatively simple query. Um, so, I mean, I think it would be a great, you know, addition. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think that that was probably one of the, um, I think as Amy Obama said, I think it was a feature we were sort of hoping to include in 3.1. Maybe we would make it a priority for 3.2, but yeah, it did not seem like, and again, I say this with some members of the Shrine technical team on the line, so hopefully I'm not um, saying something that they disagree with, but it did not seem like a gigantic, uh, you know, technical feat to include. So that might be a strong possibility to, uh, to try to have into 3.2 as well. Other thoughts about what might be valuable? So I do have a, one quick question. So um, you've made it so that breakdowns are simpler to start running because you know you're just saying demographic. But have you guys given any thought to um, the you know making it you know as it was? It was kind of a generic thing where you could create different types of stratification. Are, are, is that still going to be a possibility within Shrine as it is in I2B2, or is it just going to be limited to the demographic um, strategy? Like, like an entirely custom breakdown? Right. So like in new, you know, in the later, the newer versions of I2B2, mm -hmm. you can take a query and then stratify it by the top 20 meds or, you know, top 20 labs or, or things of that nature. So it's very flexible in its functionality and it's, you know, depending on the network or whatever, select, you know, create them just as they do ontology items. Um, is there a thought into making that feature more generic like that? I mean, Inupama, I think that you've, I think you're aware of that possibility. I don't, I guess I'm not sure that we've- Yeah, so we had, that. we had discussed yeah, we have discussed that ability to give users complete control over defining what they wanted in their breakdowns. I think the issue we ran into is that while it's um, for ITB2, it's, it's a local instance of being able to get those values is just for it, that site, whereas for Shrine, we have to be some coordination um, among the network itself to make sure the breakdowns were configured in a way to account for those um, uh, customizations or dynamic breakdowns and um, it just required a bit more technical lift, but um, we might explore alternate ways of being able to build out that functionality. So it's not so reliant on, on other sites of the network having configured it correctly. Okay, so it might be, might be a little more challenging in a network setup, but that doesn't mean it's not valuable. Other other thoughts about either about that or about other other possibilities or things that again we haven't even thought of here um, or haven't talked about here that might be valuable for Shrine is as you think of it as a a product that gets used in the open source community. The one thing that I think I I don't know if it's as valuable to the product or to the experience of the product. I'm curious if folks how folks react to this. But the, one of the most common questions that I feel like I end up getting or seeing kind of across my desk has to do with query topics and sort of a confusion about what and why and who and why are you asking me for this? And, um, and you know, folks seem like they're, they're not quite, yeah, appreciating the, the feature for what it is supposed to do. And I wonder if it just means we should rethink whether it's necessary at all. Um, you know, part of the, the history of query topics has to do with, I've kind of put it like in, you know, pool, when you call your shot, you're sort of saying, I'm using the network for this purpose. And it allows someone else to say, I can see how you're using it for that purpose and allow someone to monitor. But um, that is not something that people quite like imagine needs to be done when they're using the network. So I know folks have feelings about that, but that's the, probably one of the more common questions I get about why do we have to do this? Or why don't I just put in counts? What about, just to throw out a crazy idea, we, we talk 
in some of our I2B2 meetings about how it would be great to get the Shrine UI on I2B2, which would require the, the, so the local side as well as the network side, because it's a cool UI, um, but it would require a lot of backend work to support the I2B2 message API. That That is probably way beyond something that would fit in your roadmap, but just thought I'd throw it out there because we think about it a lot. Yeah, the benefit of saying that to someone like me is I have no idea what that would be. <laughs> so, so I'm happy to hear it uh, as an idea, but I, I don't know what that would entail. So, but that would be, do you think it's, is the value there just because the UI might be easier to use or to have the UIs essentially be the same? Um, well, no, I, I think we'd, we'd probably, yeah, well, so part of it would be that users who are not familiar with the I2B2 user interface would be able to go from the shrine to the local I2B2 without having to learn a new UI. Um, another thing is that for um, basic features, I, I think this is, the new Shrine UI is a lot more fluid and appealing, even though it doesn't support all of the advanced features on the local I2B2 side. So it might be a, a nice, you, you know, a nice kind of, um, way for new people to get into I2B2 and, and uh, find the interface more appealing. Yeah, and I think we, we've, there's definitely a conversation also about the right workflow. Like what they start in I2B2, maybe they could toggle between um, a beginner UI or an advanced UI. And then once they've found their local accounts, maybe there's a button to take them to a network, to the Shrine network to then be able to run that same query. So that would also be a, a way we can figure out how to incorporate like a, a user journey through the applications. I see. And do folks feel like, again, this is sort of my asking relatively naively here, that a lot of folks will go from local search to network search versus the other way around? Or is there a sense for what the most, what the typical flow would be? I personally think the pattern would be you do your local search and then if you need more people or more whatever, then you would want to push it towards Shrine so that you could see what's going on in the network versus the way we're doing it now. Um, but there's not really a way to do that now. Any other thoughts on that? Anyone else have any insight into, I see from uh, Eric just mentioning that um, local first would be maybe the typical flow for a researcher or I guess I'm imagining it would be, do I have enough patients at my site to do this thing or to, to proceed? And then if not, go to the network. Um, and then there's a question here from Lyndon about um, recreating a previous query and rerunning it. Um, there is a way to recreate a previous query. Um, and yes, as Michelle mentions, if it collapses all of the terms. Um, oh, and there's also a few enhancements that I think been inspired by comments you made, Michelle, that we've thought about in this sort of enhancements bucket of like being able to jump to a, a term in the uh, in the medical concepts list, um, so that you can sort of map from query that you've constructed and may have already run into okay, let me find where this term is in there. So I mean, again, I'm sort of calling that like jump to because that's what I'm thinking of from other applications. Mark, this is David. Um one of the things that's come up at conferences a lot is that when people high up in leadership talk about shrine, they talk about looking for people to uh, to collaborate. Uh, is that is that something that people feel at the day to day level, or is it is it just something that seems like a good abstract thing? And is there something shrine can do to to make that more real? I'm curious if there's any feedback from those uh, those assembled, whether there is that kind of, okay, I've done my query, now what? How would I get in touch with someone? There's there's kind of two questions maybe. One is, you know, what's the possibilities that we've been exploring in terms of like how that would work? And um, in, in many ways, 4CE is about how that works. Um, and um, for those not familiar with 4CE, which is a network which is kind of even outside of Shrine, where we go to the I2B2 databases and we get data into files that can then get processed by a whole series of um, steps where you go from a standard set of files to a 
specific program either in SQL or in R that then produces a analysis at the site. And then we combine those analytic results uh, either you know, early on where we're just looking at aggregate of uh, like how a lab trends to something later on like a survival curve. And that's been proceeding very nicely. We've had, we have uh, five papers out now, two nature papers, uh, Jamie a paper, uh, JAMA paper, and uh, I forget what the other one is. Anyway, okay. So, but the real question I think also is what about governance, right? So you have done a query in the shrine and you get back your obfuscated results and that kind of is, you know, protecting you, so to speak, uh, it, from, from, you know, any HIPAA, you know, violations. So what do you do in order to change the governance in some ways of trying to enable that? And that's a more complicated question in terms of, okay, so does everybody need to agree to um, exchange patient level data? And the answer is, um, we've not gone there. As you know, I mean, I2B2 does that with its, um, with, with its web services. Uh, if you allow people to do it with either a limited data access flag or a protected data access flag, but we don't do that directly in Shrine ever. Um, everything is limited to an I2B2 local uh, um, analysis. So it starts with the Shrine query. The Shrine query identifies the cohort the cohort is then materialized in your I2B2 because obviously there's a communication between I2B2 and Shrine or nothing would be possible. And then um, it proceeds locally from there and that's how the governance is currently being written to do. Um, I'm not sure we ever anticipate, um, you know, returning patient level results with Shrine. I don't think that's ever been on the roadmap. I guess the, the next step might be that we automatically are able to put data from the local sites into some kind of an enclave to allow some kind of a cohort to be created and, and studied, but that's nowhere on the uh, implementation phase, that's purely on the conceptual phase. Thank you, Sean, and I appreciate that thoughtful response. Um, I do wanna be mindful of time here and uh, just share, um, I guess a little plug for the virtual season, which is uh, June 22nd and 23rd. Uh, I think we will be able to have some additional conversations about um, Shrine at that meeting, perhaps. Um, I think we'll probably still have some conversations about what that might look like, but I did want to make a plug for the uh, Foundation's virtual symposium and also um, wrap up by thanking the Foundation for giving us this platform for the Shrine team to hear feedback. Um, and also thank the folks who have attended and uh, given us feedback on where we might go next and what might be most valuable. So with that, I will wrap up. Um, I don't know if Diana or Rudy, anything to, uh, to finish just, up? Mark will just say another thanks to um, you all for doing this. I think that uh, absolutely we are gonna make, a, make this available at the, the June meeting. And um, if people have ideas about what they'd like to cover at that June meeting, Certainly send us, you know, send Mark or send me, you know, an email so we can we can help put that together. But thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you have a great day.